Okay. Um, can I have everyone's attention, please? Um, so we're down to the last stretch. And so I'm just going to finish up the last topic in kinetics that we will cover. And then I will work, you know, finish up that worksheet that we started looking at last week. And then I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right? And I'll talk a little bit about the final exam as well. Okay? So the last topic that we're going to look at is, remember we're looking at kinetics. Last time we talked about, you know, the rate law and how we use the experimentally measured rate law to figure out the reaction mechanism. All right? Today we're going to look at the factors that affect the rate of a reaction. So what affects how fast a reaction takes place? And there are many factors that that affect the rate of a reaction and in the onset I want to kind of tell you that all of these factors are related to each other, okay? So let's start, I've listed them out here and let's start with the first one and that is that the temperature affects how fast the reaction takes place. So chemical reactions speed up when the temperature is raised, okay? And the general rule of thumb is that for every 10 degree increment in temperature, the rate actually doubles, all right? Approximately it doubles. So that's a good rule of thumb to keep in mind. Now the reason that the reaction speeds up when you raise the temperature is because remember when we looked at reaction mechanisms, we said for a reaction to take place, molecules must collide, all right? That's what a bimolecular reaction means. That's what a termolecular reaction means. In a reaction mechanism, each step results from molecules colliding with each other. So what happens is when you raise the temperature, you raise the thermal energy and the thermal energy increases how frequently the molecules collide with each other because now the molecules have greater kinetic energy, they're moving around, bouncing around much faster and the chances that they collide with each other increases as you raise the temperature. And so the collisions increase and as the molecules collide and have the right kinetic energy, the reaction speeds up. Okay, so that the first factor that affects the rate of a reaction is the temperature. All right? And if you want to make a plot of how temperature affects rate is that if you plot the rate as a function of time, kind of increases like that. Okay? Now, if we move on to the second property or second effect, that is the frequency of collisions. Okay, so it, remember we said that the rate depends on molecules colliding. And so the more often the molecules collide with each other, the faster the reaction would be. So the rate depends on the frequency of the collisions. And the more frequent the collisions are, then the faster the reaction. So the first criterion for a reaction to take place is that molecules must collide. All right? If they collide, then you'll have a reaction taking place and as the frequency of the collision increases, the rate of that reaction increases. All right? So for reactions to occur, molecules must collide. As concentrations of reactants are increased or if the temperature is increased, the frequency of the collision increases. So one way to increase the frequency of collision is to increase the number of molecules that are there. If you have more molecules, it's going to get more crowded and therefore you're going to have more collisions and therefore the reaction is going to be faster. And that's why reaction rate depends on concentration because as the, rea as the reactants get more concentrated, you're going to have more molecules in there. The more crowded the molecules are, the chances that they'll collide with each other increases. All right? So the frequency of collision increases with concentration. Also, if you provide thermal energy, they're going to move a lot faster and if they're moving a lot faster, they can collide even faster. Remember, all of these are interrelated with each other. The third factor that influences the rate is the kinetic energy of the collisions. So we looked at the fact that if you want the reaction to take place, the molecules must collide. 
and the more frequent you have the collisions, the faster the reaction. But it turns out just having collisions is not enough, all right? When you have molecules colliding, they also have to have just the right amount of energy, all right? And why do they need the right amount of energy or a minimum amount of energy? Because the reason is that when they collide, chemical bonds must be broken and then new bonds are being formed. And as all of you know, to break a bond, does it cost energy or does it release energy? Breaking bonds always cost energy. Bond formation, when a new bond is formed, energy is released. All right? So if you want to break bonds, then can everybody see that you have a minimum amount of kinetic energy that's required to break those bonds? So let's take an example. If we take this reaction where we're looking at 2NOBr giving you 2NO plus Br2, if I draw the Lewis structure, can you see that the central atom will be nitrogen and this is the Lewis structure of your reactant. When two molecules of these collide with each other, you end up with the products which is 2NO So this is what the Lewis structure of your reactants and products are. NO, as you can see, is an odd electron molecule. So it's got an odd number of electrons. And so you see there's one odd electron. And if you look at this, you can see that in this reaction, bonds are being broken. So which bond is being broken? Can you see that this bond is broken and this bond is broken? So this, uh, these are broken. And this bond is formed. So in this reaction you can see chemical bonds are broken and new bonds are being formed. So the act of the collision, when the two molecules collide, they must have sufficient energy, the kinetic energy. Remember the molecules are moving around and the energy that the molecules have by virtue of their motion is the kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy of the molecules that are moving when they collide has to be sufficient to overcome the potential energy required to break these bonds. Can everybody see that? And so it's something like this. You can think about it as if, um, I'm going to use an analogy and the same, you know, if you want to look at the minimum amount of energy that you, you need, it's like if you wanted to hit a golf ball over a hill. And let's say you have a golf ball right here. And let's say you hit this golf ball. Can everybody see that if I hit this ball, I have to hit it with sufficient energy to get it to the top. That's the tipping point. If it has sufficient, if I hit the ball with just the right amount of energy to exceed the tipping point, then the ball will roll over onto the other side. If I don't hit it with sufficient energy, let's say the ball ends up here, you know that it's going to roll back here. All right? So likewise, when two molecules collide, you have to have sufficient energy to get beyond that tipping point. All right? The tipping point is having sufficient energy to break those bonds. All right? If you hit that tipping point, then everything else is downhill. And therefore, the second point is that the molecules, when they collide, not every collision actually leads to products. The collision has to have sufficient kinetic energy to overcome that energy barrier. And that the energy barrier is what? The breaking of the bonds, all right? So we describe this in the form of what we call a reaction profile. And the reaction profile is a plot of potential energy versus progress of reaction, okay? And so over here, this, this is the reactant. And so the reactants, this is the potential energy of the reactants, and in this case, the reactants are 2 NOBr. Over here are the products, and we have 2 NO plus Br2 as our products. 
And so when reactants go to products, this reaction is an exothermic reaction. So this is delta H is negative. As reactants go, you start with a high potential energy and you go into a product with a low potential energy and the difference, is, remember you can't create or destroy energy and so the energy is released as heat and that's delta H, all right? Now it turns out that this tipping point is shown here. There's a certain amount of, minimum amount of energy ne that needs to be provided. This is the little hill in, in that golf ball example. This is the minimum amount of energy. This is the tipping point, the minimum amount of energy that needs to be put in for, to break the potential energy associated with the bonds, okay, to break bonds. And we call that energy, so this difference in energy between here and here is called the activation energy. And the activation energy is given the symbol E subscript A. All right, so the second factor we said was that, you know, we said molecules must collide. If you want a reaction to take place, molecules must collide. And the more often they collide, the better. So the higher the frequency of collisions, the better. But the second point is it's just not enough for them to collide. When the collision occurs, they have to have sufficient energy, all right? And they have to have sufficient energy because bonds are being broken. And so the kinetic energy of the molecules, when they collide, the kinetic energy has to be sufficient to overcome the potential energy required to break bonds, all right? And that, that energy is called the activation energy, all right? So overall, the, the collision has to provide sufficient kinetic energy to get above this hump. Now this highest point here, the highest energy point is called the transition state. All right, so this plot of potential energy versus the reaction progress is called a reaction profile. And in the reaction profile, you always indicate what the activation energy is. And so if you provide, the kinetic energy of the collision provides that amount of energy. That's the minimum amount, that's the tipping point. If it has energy greater than that, great. It gets over the hump. And then once it gets over the hump, now it's all downhill and it gets to the products. And so this is the amount of thermal energy that will be released. So this is the amount of energy that's released, but this is the amount of energy that needs to be put in at the beginning to get the process going. Do you see that? And that's called the activation energy. So that's the second factor. So you can see here that um, um, when two molecules collide, the kinetic energy is changed to potential energy as the molecules undergo bond breaking and bond formation leading to product molecules. However, not all collisions lead to products. This is because the molecules need a minimum amount of energy to react. This energy requirement is called the activation energy or of the reaction and the symbol that we use is E sub A. Unless the kinetic energy of the collision is equal or greater than the activation energy, no reaction will occur. So, so we're gonna go back again. We said if you want a reaction to take place, they have to collide, all right? And the more often they collide, the better. So the more frequent the collisions, the better. So if you make it concentrated, if you increase the temperature, you increase the frequency of collisions, okay? Second is, but that's not good enough. Just because they collide doesn't mean it's gonna to lead to products. They also have to have sufficient kinetic energy. So when you heat the reactants, now you increase the thermal energy and therefore the molecules are moving much faster, they're gonna have greater kinetic energy. So if you raise the temperature, they're gonna react faster because you're gonna have, some, it's not only are you increasing the frequency of collision, but also you're increasing the kinetic energy of the molecules and therefore the rate will go up. But the third is, so we said, just colliding is not good enough. They have to have sufficient kinetic energy. Now the second is, even if they collide, and even if they have the right amount of kinetic energy, that's not good enough. They also have to collide in just the right way. So they ought to have what we say, the right orientation. So not every collision 
with the right amount of kinetic energy actually leads to products. The reason is, as I said before, when the molecules hit each other, they have to hit each other in just the right way. And what do I mean by just the right way? To do that, I'm going to show the space filling model for the same reaction. So let's say I have oxygen is smaller, nitrogen is a little bigger, and then bromine is the biggest. So if I take NOBR, this is what the space filling model would look like. So this is oxygen, nitrogen, bromine. Now let's say that these molecules hit each other this way. So when they hit each other, the point of contact is between oxygen and bromine. So if they hit each other in this orientation, we call this the orientation or the directionality, the way the, the orientation in which they hit, if they hit each other this way, there is no reaction. So they're hitting each other in the wrong orientation. However, if they hit each other in this way, so this is oxygen, nitrogen is a little bigger, bromine is the biggest one, this is a space filling model, but now if they hit each other now this way and the point of contact is like this, now remember in this reaction there's a new bond being formed. Can everybody see that? And the new bond is being formed between two bromine atoms. So if they hit, so the point of contact, contact is between the two bromines, can you see now this is where the new bond is being formed? So what will happen is this is the new bond to be formed and you can see when that happens, when the new bond is being formed, you can see that now this can break up like that. All right, so can everybody see that kind of everything is set up so the instant they come into contact, you have a new bond being formed and the other two will break off. And so now they're hitting each other in just the right orientation so that you end up with the Br2 molecule being formed and then the two oxygen is being formed as well. So, so it turns out it's much more complicated than just molecules colliding. So what you have to keep in mind is they have to collide the first and the more often they collide the better. Two, they have to have the right amount of kinetic energy. So the more kinetic energy, sufficient kinetic energy for the bonds to be broken, all right? And thirdly, even if they have lots of collisions and even if they have the right amount of kinetic energy, you won't get the reaction taking place unless the molecules hit in just the right way, all right? And so when they collide, they have to collide in the right orientation. So all these factors influence how fast a reaction takes place. Now this orientation is called the steric factor, St all right? Steric refers to three-dimensional orientation, all right? And so it the, the orientation depends on the three dimensions and how the molecules hit each other in three dimensions and so the, the, we call this the steric factor, all right? The orientation when the molecules hit each other. Now, so if I ask you what are the factors that influence how fast a reaction takes place, then you should know that not only temperature affects it but also the frequency of the collisions affected, the kinetic energy of the collisions affected and also the orientation affects how fast the reaction proceeds and whether a reaction will take place or not, all right? Now Arrhenius came up with a mathematical equation that takes all of these factors into account. So if you want to come up with a mathematical equation that describes the relationship of all of these factors combined, then it's given by this equation which is called the Arrhenius equation, all right? One form of the equation is written as K which is the rate constant for the reaction. Now here we're using rate constant instead of rate because a rate of a reaction, remember, depends on concentration. We've seen that the rate varies on concentration. The more concentrated it is, the faster the reaction would be. Now rate constant is independent, it's a constant. And so it's a better factor, if you want to compare different reactions, it's better to look at rate constant because rate constant is independent of the concentration because it's a concentration, 
All right? So we're looking at the dependence of rate constant K equals what we call a constant A. This is called the Arrhenius factor and this accounts for collision frequency and the steric factor. Remember the steric factor is the orientation. Collision frequency is how often they collide, right? So the Arrhenius factor A takes into account how often they collide as well as the steric factor and Every reaction has a unique value for A. A is a constant and it's, you know, it's available in tables and every unique reaction will have a unique constant that corresponds to A. EA is the activation energy and the activation energy usually is in units of kilojoules per mole. R is the gas constant. Now remember, I want you to keep in mind that in this term, the activation energy is divided by the gas constant and the unit for activation energy is kilojoules per mole. That means if you're using this R, you, remember R is the gas constant in the SI units, the unit for gas constants is joules per Kelvin per mole. So I want to convert that to kilojoules and to do that, all of you recognize that one kilojoules is 10 to the 3 joules. So when I use this gas constant, in this equation, it's important that I divide it by a thousand so that I have the unit kilojoules per mole rather than joules per Kelvin per mole, okay? So we have that and of course T is the Kelvin temperature. So this form of the reaction can also be written like this where ln K equals, now if I take the natural log, ln K equals ln A minus EA over RT and if I rearrange this equation so that I have ln K equals negative EA over R, 1 over T plus ln A. I'm just putting this in the form of Y equals MX plus C. So if I take, if y, the rate constant is the Y axis, then this term will be the slope and that would be the x-axis plus c would be the intercept. So if I can measure the rate constant at different temperatures, so if I make a plot of ln lowercase k, okay, not capital K because that's equilibrium constant, this is rate constant. Experimentally we can measure rate constants at different temperatures and if I plot that versus 1 over T and remember this is in units of Kelvin and if I end up with, then I would end up with a graph that has a negative slope where the slope will give me the activation energy divided by the gas constant and keep in mind it's a negative slope. So this is how experimentally we figure out the activation energy for, our, for any reaction. So if you want to figure out the activation energy, for a reaction, what you do is you measure the rate constants at different temperatures, all right? And you plot it L and K versus 1 over T and you figure out what the slope is and from the slope you can divide, uh, you know, take the slope and multiply it by the gas constant in kilojoules per mole and that will give you the activation energy, all right? And you may have done this in the lab um, when you were looking at the kinetics experiment, okay? Now lastly, if you want to look at the dependence of L and K on temperature and let's say we're looking at, so let's take this equation where we say L and K equals, so this is lowercase k minus EA over R 1 over T plus L and A and let's say we're looking at this at one temperature. So if this is K1, this would be T1. All right, activation energy does not change, R does not change and LNA remember is a constant that's unique for each reaction. So if I take another reaction where it's LNK2, this would be negative EA over R, 1 over T2 plus LNA. Now since these two are LNAs, if I rearrange this, can everybody see that if I take this term over here, I can say LNK1 plus EA over R 1 over T1 equals ln K2 plus EA over R 1 over T2. 
Can everybody see what I'm doing? Because L and A is a constant. Remember, A is unique for a particular reaction. So as long as we're looking at the same reaction, all right, all we're looking at is the dependence of rate constant on temperature. This term L and A would be this plus that. This L and A would be this plus this if I take it over here. And since L and A is the same for both, I know these two are equal to each other. And therefore, if I take L and K1 minus L and K2, now this would become EA over R, 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. And L and K, this would become L and K1 over K2 would equal EA over R, 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. All right, so if, you're, if ever you want to figure out the rate constant at one temperature and you want to figure out the rate constant at another temperature, you would use that equation, all right? And that would help you figure it out. Now this fa same form of the equation can be written like in some textbooks, you'll see this written out like this. Ln K1 over K2 equals negative EA over R, but now it's T1 minus T2. Either one we, okay? So all I'm doing is switching the sign here, flipping this around and putting a negative sign in front. Both those equations are the same, all right? And some textbooks give the latter equation, some give the former equation. All right? So that kind of completes what we're going to look at. And so the last thing that we looked at is the factors that influence how fast a reaction proceeds. And we looked at a chemical equation that relates all the factors that influence how fast a reaction takes place. Now within the last few minutes, I want to kind of take an example because ultimately it's about applying these in problems. So let's stop there for today and for the one last thing that I just want to talk briefly about the exam, okay, the last minute. And I want to remind everybody that the final exam is on Wednesday. It's at 8 a.m. so your exam time is different from the class time, okay? The exam will be cumulative but greater burden will be on the new material. So almost half the exam will be on kinetics, all right? The other half will include everything that we covered this quarter. So I, please review the, the intro to equilibria. You should be able to draw equilibrium problems. You should be able to do equilibrium problems. You should know the relationship between equilibrium and free energy. Remember we said delta G equals minus RT, L, and K, um, you know, uh, the relationship between free energy and equilibrium constant, all right, which goes back to the, the beginning of equilibria, right up to what we've covered to electrochemistry. But I understand that you will not be able to study everything. So for the material that's cumulative other than kinetics, I'm looking at the big picture. I want to see whether you see relationships. I'm not, so it's more big picture, more conceptual, rather than, you know, sort of very detailed problems where you have to go through a lot of detail, okay? So I want to see whether you've mastered just the, the big picture items, all right? So this is the last quarter I'm going to see you, so good luck. I wish you all the very best, all right? Thank you. Thank you.